involved with RSN for nearly 15 years. Support from someone who's been there makes all the difference. Hey David, what are you listening to? Kidney Talk, an online radio podcast that talks about kidney disease and the prevention of it. Oh cool, where can I find that? Oh, you can download it on iHeartRadio, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. Oh nice, I'll definitely have to download that. Shout out to Renal Support Network, the annual Renal Support Network essay contest. I won the Renal Support Network contest last year, the warrior and we are all warriors. So thank you, thank you. Keep on doing all that you do and um, be happy and healthy and keep the hope. Thank you, Renal Support Network, woohoo! As a kidney transplant recipient, I find that having an actual publication like Kidney Talk is an invaluable resource for any kidney warrior at any stage. me informed of kidney advocacy issues so my voice can be heard. I'm really looking forward to the prom this year and meeting people who are just like me. Dressing up is super fun and all the activities are amazing. Can't wait to see you there! participating in the Renal Support Network 30-minute fitness Zoom classes. Not only have I lost 15 pounds, but I can also strike a yoga pose like this. When I created Renal Support Network back in 1993, I had no idea the impact that I would have among my peers. An illness is too demanding when you don't have hope, and peer support, education, and knowledge are crucial to our survival. We have a great week planned with some incredible speakers, uh, great uh, information for you to share, learn, so we can survive and thrive with this illness. It's imperative. So uh, stay tuned. We're going to have a great event, and a shout out to our corporate mission partners for making this happen. get started. So the topic is psychological issues of kidney transplantation. Uh, Mike Mar Ma Mark Meyer is a licensed clinical social worker and is the co-founder of the Face It Foundation, which is a Minneapolis-based organization that provides peer support for men who deal with depression. In addition to his role on Face It, Mark is on staff of the Department of Medicine and Com Community Health in the University of Minnesota School of Medicine. Uh, Mark has worked extensively in dialysis clinics and social worker. Uh, he's a trained patient care technician and was a facility administrator. So he's very familiar with us. So um, thank you so much, Mark, for joining us. And uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. And uh, I'm going to just share my screen if I'm not doing this the way you want. I, I put together a PowerPoint. Uh, All right. There we go. Well, if I could just echo one thing that, that Lubna just shared that, that I didn't um, put in my talk. L Lori, I, I asked me to do this talk very recently, and so I, um, uh, I'm going to try to cover some high-level stuff here and, and just give some tips and ideas and share some thoughts around psychological issues, emotional issues. Um, but something that, that Lubna touched on that is so critical for everybody, particularly um, as we head into winter, as we head into continued challenges with shutdowns, is exercise. Uh, exercise is such a critical, critical thing for our mental health and our well-being. So um, I will uh, right off the right off the bat just uh, hit that point that you know finding time to exercise and take care of ourselves physically is such such an important issue. So, all right, well let's let's dive in. Uh, Lori already told you who I am, so I can I can move move beyond that. Um, one thing I'll say is that, you know, the vast majority of my experience has been in, in working in the dialysis clinic and in various capacities. And I worked for one of the, the quality improvement networks for a number of years, um, one of the kidney uh, ESRD organizations. And, you know, transplantation, as, as everybody who's on this call knows, this is a really big deal. And, and one of the 
What are the emotional, psychological implications of transplant that so often gets lost in conversations is, you know, it, it gets held out as this goal and, and that this is the end game. And if you don't get a transplant, well, then somehow, um, you know, your life on dialysis and the challenges you face there, it's, it's not complete. And it's, it's just, it's not true, right? And, and so when a transplant is received, there's a tremendous amount of pressure. And, and things change, things change within yourself, things change within your relationship with your healthcare providers, they change within your family. And so it's really, uh, uh, really important to understand just how big of a moment this is from our mental health standpoint to, to get this, uh, to get a transplant. And, and something that is just recurrent, and this is certainly not true just of transplant, this is true of dialysis, this is true of any, any, chronic disease that individuals live with, which is that our emotions truly do drive and are one of the most influential factors in determining quality of life. Um, and, and, and if you think about why that is, we're going we're gonna to get into this a little bit more and, and discuss this in greater detail. Um, but our emotions, our feeling state, our thought states drive our actions in so many ways. I, I, I was just thinking about something I, I caught Lubna saying at the end, you know, she asked you when you're, you're in, uh, in the uh, grocery store to, to have that willpower and to avoid those foods that aren't good for you. And, and willpower is not something we just take off the shelf and put on and suddenly everything is, you know, within our control. Willpower is driven by how we feel about ourselves, how we feel in the moment. If we are feeling anxious, boy, willpower just goes right out the door. If we're feeling hopeless and, 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 and pessimistic, willpower goes right out the door. And so really understanding how critical your emotional well-being is, um, is something that can never get lost in this conversation. And, and I know that, you know, we oftentimes, we talk more about the physiology and the physical nature and the, you know, the medications and the things we need to, the diets and the things we need to, 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 to take care of. But I'm really here to tell you, you got to take care of your emotional well-being. So as I thought about what to talk about, there's, there's three issues that are really frequently cited um, when we talk about post-transplant or pre-transplant in the process of getting ready. And, and the guilt is, a, um, guilt is a thing that gets brought up in the literature all the time. And for those of you who are you know, on dialysis, post-dialysis, Depression and anxiety are really prevalent issues for individuals dealing with kidney disease. So these three things, the guilt, the depression, the anxiety, what I want to do is I want to just lay them out a little bit for you. I'm not here to teach you what each one is or the mechanisms of each one, but I want to just put them on the table so we can look at them objectively, talk about some skills, talk about some things you can think about if you start to pursue therapy, um, or talk about the things that you can do to really help manage these issues yourself. So guilt. Well, we know a lot about guilt, right? A lot of us were raised on guilt. And, and I'm going to actually change the dynamic here a little bit. I'm going to talk about this notion of shame for just a minute. But first, let's talk about guilt because, again, it, it, it comes up all the time. And, and it's, you know, guilt is this common reaction people have after a transplant. Patients report thinking about the donor, feeling guilty about benefiting from the donor's death. Um, this feeling can be especially strong for people who became very ill while waiting and maybe prayed or hoped for an organ to become available. And then after the procedure, some get the feeling that they had been wishing for someone else to die. So this notion of guilt is a prominent issue because the reality is, in, in, unless it's a living related, and, and even then there can be uh, lots of guilt that can occur we find ourselves benefiting from somebody else's challenge. And so this triggers in so many of us an emotional reaction that is actually quite frankly is, is quite normal. And so how do, we, how do we address this guilt? Well, you could write a letter. If somehow you're fortunate to be connected to the donor family, you could develop a relationship. But you know, writing a letter is a really critical component. We do this in, in therapy sessions all the time. We write letters to people or, or to people we've lost or to people who didn't treat us well. And we may never get to deliver these letters actually in person, but just by sharing a letter, you can explain your feelings, you can explain your thoughts, you can explain the things that you were dealing with. 
And a lot of times there is resolution to our guilt that we can find. Focus on the meaning. You know, for a lot of donor families, <clears throat> the untimely death of a loved one, the loss of a loved one, there is meaning in being able to share what their life meant by giving, you know, by donating organs and by, and by giving somebody else the opportunity to continue. And so if you can focus in on that part of this, I can tell you from my own personal experience that when my father passed away, we were able to donate some, some of his organs. And while of course it didn't bring back my dad, it didn't alleviate the sadness and the grief that we felt, there was this part of us that thought, well, gosh, we could share him in some ways with people and make their lives better. And I knew that was something my dad would certainly be glad about. So think about guilt for a moment. And I want you to just give this some thought. And, and this is, you know, if you, if you knew me or if you've ever heard me speak, I, I talk a lot about shame. Because one of the things about guilt is that guilt is sort of based on this notion that we did something wrong that we did something that we should not have. And so when you think about associating this notion of guilt with receiving a transplant, you didn't do anything wrong. You didn't commit some act that therefore benefited you. And so what happens really is one of the things we have to be aware of is this role shame plays in our life. And this role shame plays in receiving a transplant. You know, when you think about what shame is, and, and you can read the definition here, but shame is this notion that I'm not worthy. It is this notion that I don't deserve something. Shame is this notion that somebody else should have gotten this, not me. And if we don't, you know, if we don't address and understand shame and how it drives us and how it can impact the way we act, um, so many of life's benefits and joys and gifts get lost because we view ourselves as unworthy. And when you think about shame and what it feels like, this is a heck of a way to try to live your life post-transplant or as you prepare for a transplant, um, feeling as though you're inadequate or that you're uh, weak or that you're uh, rejected or that you're unworthy. And, and these feelings of shame are always generally, very, very often associated with um, poor outcomes. And, and shame is something we don't talk as much about. I mean, we've all heard, you know, we've all heard the talk about, you know, depression and kidney disease, anxiety and kidney disease, um, sleep issues and kidney disease. Shame is an issue that is, is really an important driver in, in regard to our mental health. So one of the things you can do to make sure you adjust, and, and remember going back to that, that first couple of screens that I showed you, where I said, look, your, your emotional well-being is probably one of the single greatest determinants of how you're going to manage life post-transplant or as you prepare for a transplant. So think about trying to move past your shame. You're worthy of a transplant. You're worthy of all the compassion and kindness that life has to offer you. And you're at, gift, you're at peace with this gift of a transplant. And, and dealing with our shame really does require that we take an active role and that we openly and, and willingly um, challenge these thoughts that we have about ourselves, and, and that we are always thinking about, you know what, I matter just like the next person. And, and, and you didn't wish ill will. You, you may have had normal thoughts about your own pain and suffering and thought about, well, gosh, if somebody else had troubles and then I were to benefit. I mean, we think these things. That, that doesn't make you a bad person. That makes you somebody who's trying to cope with the, the, the profound challenges you have in your own life. And so really understanding that you are indeed worthy of a transplant. Depression and anxiety. I'm going to talk a little bit about this just because it is such a critical and crucial and, and, and um, prominent issue. When, when you look at rates of depression, and I'm talking about true clinical major depressive issues and issues of anxiety, such as you know, generalized anxiety disorder and, and some of the other anxiety disorders, individuals on kidney, on kidney dialysis are burdened with these two conditions at a really high rate. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of literature that suggests 
that up to 50% of the dialysis population is dealing with clinical uh, depression. And, and prevalence rates of anxiety are actually higher in the United States than depression. Um, and so these are really common, common conditions that people deal with. And, and when you think about what we talk about here, I'm just going to read this real quick. <clears throat> anxiety and depression are the most common psychological disorders in kidney transplant recipients that may affect the disease process and graft survival. Anxiety and depression, now here's the, the critical part here, have been associated with non we'll say non-adherence with medication use, personal care, compromised quality of life, and difficulty in, in, in integrating the newly acquired graph into their sense of self. When we don't feel good about ourselves, such as depression does to us, when we feel anxious, you know, this notion of fear that something bad is going to happen or that our graft is gonna fail or that we didn't deserve this graft, when we feel these things, it takes away from our ability to focus. It takes away from our ability to concentrate. It takes away from our ability to connect with other people. It takes away from our ability to simply feel good about this wonderful thing that has happened. So we really need to understand depression and anxiety so we can manage them. So I wanna talk just for a moment about some strategies. And, and I'm gonna give you the old lecture here that you've probably heard many times before about caring for yourself. And as Lori mentioned, I, I run an organization focused on, on men who deal with depression and, and PTSD, and I work with a lot of suicide attempt survivors. And a lot of us carry around this idea that caring for ourselves um, is selfish, it's putting ourselves first, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's indicative that we're not grateful. And, and I always think of the simplest analogy, right? We've all been in an airplane and we've all heard, you know, in the event of loss of cabin pressure, be sure to secure your mask first, right? We have to learn to care for ourselves. We have to learn to put ourselves first. Now, what does that mean? Well, that doesn't mean you take food from somebody. That doesn't mean you push your way to the front of the line. That doesn't mean, you know, that you go out of your way to, to just take what's yours, yours, yours. But what it means is we care for ourselves. We care for ourselves emotionally. We care for ourselves physically. We care for ourselves socially. And, and learning to care for ourselves, if you want to go back to this notion of why your emotional need or your emotional health is so important, if you don't put yourself first, this transplant you received is at risk. If you don't learn how to take time to exercise, this transplant you received is at risk. If you don't learn to take time to buy the proper foods, to eat the right diet, this transplant you received is at risk. So while we're simultaneously caring for ourselves, we're actually showing a great deal of respect to this, this amazing gift that's been received. So I wanna talk a little bit about, I'm just gonna talk about four different types of high, uh, kind of a high level conversation about interventions. And by interventions, for those of you who have done therapy, those of you who are contemplating therapy, you've seen all of these things before, or you've heard these things before. For those of you who are, are struggling with any sort of depression or anxiety or emotional issues or adjustment issues, these are just conversations to talk about approaches and, and, and ways to begin to understand how your uh, mental health is functioning with regard to how you think, how you act, um, who you spend time with, and, and the techniques you teach yourself. So let's just talk a little bit about cognitive interventions. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just jump here real quick, and then I'm going to go back. So many of you have probably seen something like this before. And this cognitive triad, what this describes is our thoughts and our beliefs, our feelings and our behaviors. So bear with me for just a moment here. And let's, let's take a look at, and, and again, this isn't just as simple as, you know, the power of positive thinking, although there is a lot of benefit in thinking positively versus thinking negatively. But let's go up to the top here for just a moment. And if you carry around a thought or a belief that you weren't worthy of receiving this transplant, your life was bad, you made all sorts of you know, choices that compromised your health, and gosh, I just, I'm not worth this. I should have never received this. Somebody else should have gotten this. Well, how do you suppose that makes you feel? Well, it doesn't make you feel good. It makes you feel as though you've cheated the system. It makes you feel as though um, you're not worthy. And so how do we behave? Well, 
we generally don't follow our diet. We don't take our medications. We don't connect with people. We don't exercise. So as you can see, if we can pay attention to how we think, how we believe, we have a chance to try to influence the way we feel and the way we act. So let's, let's flip that on its head for just a moment. And let's say your belief is, gosh, I'm really worthy of receiving this transplant. And I am a good person and gosh, what a great opportunity. You're going to feel optimism. You're going to feel a sense of hope. You're far more likely to engage in behaviors that are gonna help you take care of yourself rather than dismissing and disregarding yourself. So the goal of these interventions is to help you recognize and identify your negative thoughts and your beliefs. And then the idea is we wanna teach you how to learn different ways of thinking. We wanna teach you to learn different ways about believing and looking at the way, um, the way we interact with our, our transplant, the way we interact with our family and our friends and all of um, these so critical components of our well-being, so that we can begin to have positive beliefs and thoughts about who we are. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to restructure the beliefs we carry. And in just a minute, I'm going to give you some ideas around um, journaling exercises and things that you can do. And, and I would assume somehow, Lori, you can share this PowerPoint since it's just now being shown for the first time. I'm happy to share it. But um, we're trying to restructure the beliefs we carry. And, and for anybody who has dealt with anxiety, who has dealt with depression, you know how easy it is to fall into these repetitive automatic toxic thoughts and beliefs that we have. We, we know that we <clears throat> can so quickly go from thinking that, oh, I can do this to, oh gosh, I can't do this. Why bother? What's the point? I'm never going to feel any better. Everything around me is horrible. And what we're trying to do is to get us to see the world differently. And, and as the third bullet point here says, we are building a new relationship with our memories and interpretations of events and our place in those events. When you think about life with a transplant, you have to build a new relationship with your dialysis, with, the, with you know, the path that your kidney disease took. And now you have a new way of living and, and relating to the world through this transplant. So these cognitive restructuring goals are, are, are very, very important. A couple of things that I often share with people around getting started on this, uh, on this journey of understanding our thoughts and beliefs is, I'm going to ask you to kind of think about a couple of things. One of the things we talk about, ask yourself this thing. Is it a good story or is it a true story? Now, when I say a good story, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a great, happy story. But is it an accurate story or is it a story you've grown used to telling yourself? So, for example, somebody who doesn't feel worthy says, see, nobody loves me. I'm such a loser and the world would be better off with me, without me. I mean, is that a good story or is that a true story? And most of the time, these stories are not true. So if you tell your, or if you ask yourself, well, what's a different way of thinking about this? Well, maybe what happened is your partner is angry with you because you, you offered to do something. And really what it is, is you feel bad when you don't follow through. And so rather than saying, see, nobody loves me, I'm a loser, the world's a bad place, we have to ask ourselves, what is the true story? And maybe the true story is, well, I didn't hold up my end of the deal and I don't feel good about myself. We have to learn to go easy on ourselves. And, and when I say I'm not responsible for my first thought, but I'm responsible for my second thought, I don't necessarily mean literally our second thought because these thoughts can come so quickly. But I want you to think about this. When you're trying to restructure how you think, when you're trying to challenge some of your beliefs, I'm not responsible for my first thought, but I'm responsible for my second thought. Okay, let's use the same example. Nobody loves me. I'm such a loser. Everyone else has it better off. I'll never get a job. And this is a quote, by the way, sorry. And the world would be better off without me. Well, is that really a good pattern of thoughts? It's a lot of negative thoughts. Or what about if we said, nobody loves me? Wait a second. What am I really needing here? What is it I'm really feeling? What is it I'm missing in my life? then that way we don't get lost in this rabbit hole of going down the negative path of, you know, everything is bad and everything is, is not good. So here's a journaling exercise we can do. And we're not going to do it now because we're not the time to do this. But 
think about these shame-based thoughts or beliefs we carry around. These notions of I'm inadequate, I'm not deserving, I'm not worthy. Um, you know, I, I should have never had this because somebody else had to, to give their life in order for me to have this. Are these thoughts we carry really true? And this is where this can be very difficult on our own because we do have such ingrained set thoughts and beliefs about ourselves. But is this thought really true? What's the evidence for this thought? What's the evidence against this thought? Well, I guess there was that one time that somebody said, gosh, you're, you're a really nice person and you're really kind and caring. And we have to, what we're doing here is we're really trying to push back against these thoughts. Who would I be if I let go of this thought? Remember when I asked you earlier is, you know, to ask yourself, is it a good story or is it a true story? Sometimes these good stories we carry around about being victims and not being worthy and not being good enough, those are things that benefit us, not in a healthy way, but in an unhealthy way. And they become sort of these patterns that we develop in the world so we don't have to be responsible, we don't have to connect with people, we don't have to try to change our circumstance. And so sometimes letting go of these negative thoughts mean we have to take some real risks and we have to agree to be vulnerable to the world in an effort to try to grow and connect with people. So as you can see here, what we're doing is we're identifying, we're challenging, we're trying to think about these, these thoughts and beliefs in a new way. Let's talk a little bit about some of the behavioral things that we can do. And goodness knows, you know, when you're a dialysis patient, energy and, and you know, feeling good, those can be those can be challenging times to come by. And sometimes life on dialysis can be very, it can be hard to find that motivation or that energy to, to do things. And certainly, you know, as you're trans, after you get a transplant, it's not as though you're right up and, and ready to go right away, but you know, hopefully you begin to feel better and you gain your energy back. And, 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 and a lot of the things that we need to do to take care of ourselves, there's always sort of this, you know, the, the good angel, bad angel on our shoulder, you know, the one angel saying, gosh, you should get out for an exercise. And the other one saying, I, I just don't feel like it. But the reality is, is that our behavior and our choices truly does indeed drive our mood. It helps with uh, uh, when we make good choices, it helps manage our depression, our anxiety. So what are the goals? Well, alone time. You know, and boy, I'm sure seeing this in the work I do, but you know, in, in, in lieu of, of COVID, people are really, really finding themselves alone an awful lot. And this is a particularly challenging time. There is just no getting around it, going, you know, going to the clinic, going to the hospital, everything just feels kind of strange and off right now. And so however we can reduce alone time. And again, this is, you know, uh, this is not to say we, <laughs> we have to be with people 24 seven, but really, you know, even the most staunch, strident of introverts that I know and have treated in my practices, they still need people. They still need to be around people. They still need um, to interact with people. Another thing that behavioral interventions can do, and I'm sure many of you uh, can identify with this, that rumination on negative thinking. You know how we get stuck and we just feel as though I can't shut my brain off and all I do is think bad things and all I do is focus on the future. You'd be surprised what your brain will do for you if you engage in an activity. Now, I'm not suggesting that you know putting together a puzzle is going to save a, a, a you know solve a lifelong um, challenges with anxiety and depression, but our brains are wired that when we are engaged in activities, when we can learn to distract and use an activity it can absolutely help interrupt some of these terrible thought processes that we get stuck in. And then of course, we're trying to get some pleasure in our life. We're trying to be social. We're trying to do some goal-directed activities. You know, the, the task you have of managing life post-transplant, I've always said this whenever I get the opportunity to speak, you know, you, you're cared for by all these people with all these advanced degrees, you know, and physicians and nurses and dietitians and social workers and patient care techs and all these incredibly, you know, amazing people. And really, you're the one that needs several degrees to manage this because, you know, we come at you 100 miles an hour with do this, do that, do this. 
really you're left to manage this thing. Your 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 home, your 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 finding yourself needing to solve some of your own problems when you don't have access to to um, you know your med medical professionals at the drop of a hat. And so when you can be engaged in goal directed activities such as making sure my my transplant lasts as long as possible, make sure I'm following my diet, make sure you know these goal directed activities. Those are activities you can engage in that will also help your mental health. One of the things that you know you hear frequently people say is, look, I just can't get started. I, I, I feel overwhelmed. Well, there's this nice little thing we call a courage ladder. And this is something very simple. And you've all tried this in one shape or form before. But we're trying to break down situations into small manageable parts. You know, you can't lose 100 pounds in a day. You can't undo past things that you've uh, engaged in in a day. We have to start small and we have to make things manageable or we get overwhelmed. Excuse me. So if you think about something you're trying to do, a behavior you're trying to engage in, can you break it down? Can you make it more manageable so that when you start this thing, it is something you can begin to accomplish? And, and oftentimes, if you start with something that's least frightening or least difficult, you know, maybe, maybe let's talk about learning to better manage um, uh, medication, you know, critical. You've, you've been hearing about medication adherence and, and, and management from the minute you were told that you were dealing with kidney disease. And, and sometimes when we're not managing our meds, when we're not taking our meds, when we're not following our diet or those sorts of things, we get overwhelmed and we don't know how to start this. So what is is something we could do to start it? Well, maybe it's as simple as acknowledging to a partner or a friend, I need help. I need to talk to somebody about my medication because I'm not doing it probably the way I'm supposed to. Rather than, well, I just got to call the doctor and do everything as, as prescribed. That's not a manageable situation. Start with something small. Start with something that's not overwhelming to you. Write down these goals. Have somebody help you. What are the steps that need to be taken? And then as you feel some of these successes, I feel pretty conf con confident saying to you, you'll feel better, you'll feel more hopeful, you'll, have, you'll start to gain some confidence as you move forward with these, um, these tasks. Let's talk a little bit about relaxation techniques. And I'd, I'd love to someday, uh, I'll work with you, Lori, and we'll figure out how to, and maybe RSN is already doing these things, but really teach people relaxation techniques. You know, one of the things that I've noticed in my, my therapy practice, my, my clinical work, is a lot of times people want to know why. Why do I feel this way? Why, is, why do my thoughts go this way? What is driving it? Is it my childhood? Is it my parents? Is it, you know, why, why, why? What is this? And a lot of times these things we feel, we can't put our finger on the why part of it. And we get so frustrated trying to answer that same question. Why do I feel this way? Why do I think this way? And really what we're doing sometimes is we just are repeatedly traumatizing ourselves and we're just making ourselves feel worse. And so there are relaxation techniques that we can learn and everybody uh, on this call is very capable of doing that simply calm us. Maybe don't answer the why question, but they calm us. And as we are more calm, we often feel better. So what are these things? Well, there are breathing techniques. And this is a very simple one um, that you can learn, that you can engage in. And this is the beauty of the internet today of you know, YouTube and, and, and all the apps that exist around you know, visualization and meditation and breathing techniques. But one of the things that we do the minute we start feeling anxiety is we stop breathing. We start shallow breathing. We start breathing in a manner that is actually telling our body that we are in danger, when in reality, we're not in danger, but we're feeling anxious. So learning how to breathe, learning how to really take in these full breaths to give your body its best opportunity to be calm. That's a really important thing to do. There's another thing that I teach guys all the time. It's called the emotional freedom technique. And I don't know if any of you have heard about it, but it's a form of psychological acupressure. And many of you have maybe heard it. It's called the tapping uh, approach. And, and what it is, is it's a way that we learn to calm ourselves through the use of um, affirmations um, and, 
And what we're doing is you can see these meridian points here on the top of our head and in between uh, uh, on our forehead and near our eye. And, and what we're doing is simply tapping while repeating these affirmations. I'm a good person. I'm a worthy person. I'm glad I received this transplant. Whatever it is, you would work out. And there's a lot of good material on this out on the internet. And this is something you certainly can teach yourself. And again, what is it? It's a calming technique. And we use it along with breathing. And what it will do, certainly in the midst of any sort of anxiety or panic, it will pull us back into um, the here and now. It will calm us down and give us a chance to, to react with and deal with situations in a, in a far more level, calm manner. Other things that you've heard about, and again, outside of the scope of what we're going to try to talk about today here, but these are really, really important things. Meditation, visualization, yoga. You've all heard about mindfulness. All of these strategies that are designed to calm us, to center us, to bring us into the here and now, they are all incredibly effective ways to calm our body. They're all very effective ways to help deal with depression. And, and what you get to see here, <clears throat> excuse me, is that it doesn't involve taking another medication. It doesn't necessarily involve going somewhere. We can learn to do these things in the comfort and privacy of our own home. The breathing exercise, some of the visualization, you can use those things while you're riding in the car or as you're waiting um, uh, to see your physician at your next appointment. And, and they're really things that you can do to really, really train your brain to learn to calm itself. There's a couple of therapeutic interventions that, that maybe some of you have heard about, and, and I think these are important because, and we'll take questions at the end if, if there are any, and, and, and again, you know, there are therapists and, and, and all sorts of people we can talk to, but beyond talk therapy, there is a trauma component involved in life with a chronic disease. There is a trauma component involved in receiving a kidney from somebody else. As I said at the beginning, everybody, you know, the, the, the celebration is, is huge and everybody is so excited and it's so wonderful to receive an organ, but there is trauma associated with that. There are fears, there are concerns about what if this doesn't last? What if I don't take care of it? And, and there is this trauma component that we just gloss over, that we don't talk about. And the beauty of a couple of these different types of therapy that I think are important for people with chronic disease to understand is that they can really help manage some of this traumatic component. And, and I don't know, you know, so EMDR stands for Eye Movement Desensitization Reprogramming, and ART is a newer form of that. It stands for Accelerated Resolution Therapy. And what both of these things are men, if you've heard of EMDR, and again, these are things you can take a look at. If you have more questions, you know, there are lots of therapists throughout the United States that, that practice in both of these. I can always answer questions on, on the follow-up. But <clears throat> EMDR is something that is widely, widely used in trauma. And in fact, the Department of Defense, the VA, it's really the go-to for PTSD in, in veterans. Um, and we know that trauma is much more than just having post-traumatic stress disorder. There's all kinds of components of trauma. And one of the beauties of EMDR and art is that they can help alleviate the feelings we carry around with trauma. You know, a lot of times we'll go to, we'll go to therapy and we'll talk and it feels great. And an hour later, we find ourselves just feeling bad again. And, and that's one of the limitations of talk therapy is that it can be a really long process to talk our way out of some of these these feelings. I mean, you know, rationally, we can all tell ourselves, don't think that it doesn't make sense. That's an unhealthy belief. And yet I still carry that feeling of shame, of fear, of anxiety. And that's one of the great things about EMDR and, and um, uh, accelerated resolution therapy is it can help alleviate some of these painful feelings we carry. So there, EMDR is not real new. Art is certainly not new but just something to consider and think about as you contemplate if you're gonna ever see a therapist or, or talk to somebody. Hey Mark, we have to wrap up, Mark, we have to wrap up in like a, the next couple minutes and I am totally with you with art therapy. My I last slide, therapy. I'll, be, I'll be done in one second. No, go um, ahead, I just wanted to give you a heads up and then okay. we'll have a couple questions. Perfect, and then finally peer support. 
And this is what I'm selling at Face It. And when I say selling, I don't charge for any of the work we do with the men we work with. Friends, you have this entire community and you're all on this call together. You have this community of people who understand what you're going through. And they are so valuable to you and you are so valuable to them. The more we can increase our social support, the more we can um, share our experiences with people who have been through common experiences, that will help your depression. That will help your anxiety. That will help your guilt. That will help your shame. And those are all things that are so, so very valuable. And of course, re resources, you know, psychiatrists are medical doctors. There's all sorts of different kinds of therapists, psychologists, social workers, uh, master's prepared therapists. There's lots of wonderful professional resources out there. So that's a pretty high level, um, I'll stop sharing my screen there. That's a pretty high level quick overview, but hopefully I hit on some points that, um, that you were looking for, Lori. You did an awesome job, Mark. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, we have a couple of questions before we move to Dr. Viacana. Um, I think one is, and it's really relevant, how do you respond to a family and friends? People will ask, what are you, you going to do now that you have a transplant? It's difficult because many young patients already feel shame, but you know, okay, so what are you gonna do? Like, how do you respond to that? I'm like, I would say like, when are you going to learn not to be rude? But um, <laughs> that so well, but, um, and then I'm going to bunch a couple in so we can do that. Sure. And then, um, you know, one of the persons, uh, um, I think um, LG said that her mom wants her to take care of her first. And I am a, I went to Allen on early on and cause I grew up in a family of alcoholics and it's so important to learn how to, you know, we become codependent of people. And, and I've learned a couple of things that, you know, it, it's hard because you can't solve every be people's problems, but you got to change, they can't change. And then one slogan I've learned to come is I am going to wait to worry about that. Mm -hmm. And I wait to worry until the following day. I'm going to wait to worry about that till tomorrow. And that's just a technique I have learned when you know you have so many things crashing at your doorstep health wise and you're like i can't manage this and right. i'm like i'm gonna and then i go get involved in my art projects or something like that just like you said so yes. i'm gonna let you answer that and then we're gonna move on to dr v so i you know i i, I think you know when people say what are you gonna do boy that's people putting like <laughs> laura you said well, you know you're gonna ask them when they're gonna stop not being rude you know People have expectations, and generally, I think a lot of those expectations are rooted in this desire to see other people grow. You know, what are you going to do? I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to manage each day as it comes forward to me. You don't owe it to anybody else to explain what the future holds for you now that you've received a transplant. And a lot of that goes into some of the things you were talking about, Lori, about feeling codependent, wanting to make sure everybody else is okay, wanting to make sure everybody else's needs are met, and learning that you being responsible, caring for you at this point is just enough. And that's a really important thing. Thank you. Um, Mark, you are outstanding. Um, he has an organization called the Face It Foundation. It's for men with depression. Uh, check it out on, on the internet. Uh, he does great work because I think a lot of times we don't you know, I think women are a little bit more gabby than men. This is just my ob observation. So we need to remember that it's nice that you're serving that population because um, I often see that, you know, when we have a support group, we have like 30 women and four, two men, and I think they feel outnumbered. So it's good that you can have a, a special group. Thank so, you. Well, thank um, you for having me. <laughs> it, it is, you know, and one friend makes a difference, everyone. I mean, to have a friend, you need to be a friend. And so um, it's very important to reach out and talk to people. And, you know, when you talk to them, not be all about you all the time and ask what they're doing and what their interests are and get involved in social groups and find the right friends because it's tough when you have an illness. So thank you so much. And a shout out to our corporate mission partners for making this happen.